Welcome to our third installment of our Perfect Movie Saga. It's a series I don't entirely know what to do with. Sometimes it overperforms, sometimes it underperforms, but whether or not this series is on its last leg or not, this video does give me a good excuse to talk about my legitimate favourite film of all time, The Incredibles. Yes, it probably doesn't come as much of a surprise that my favourite film of all time is a Pixar film, but The Incredibles is one I don't see on people's radar quite as much as the likes of Toy Story or something more recent. Don't get me wrong, plenty of people praise this film, but the real question is, is it another example of the perfect film? Oftentimes with Pixar films, the more time passes, the more people seem to grow to adore them and comment on how well they age most of the time and remind them of more nostalgic times. And funnily enough, a theme of nostalgia is very prevalent in The Incredibles itself, both internally and externally. The film released in the ancient day of 2004, a time period I'm particularly fond of and is growing a more nostalgic viewer base as everyone grows up. It's now the early 2000s time to be nostalgic. This was the time of my childhood when I was about seven or eight years old, and as a young impressionable kid, I wasn't surrounded by all of the crazy superhero films we're used to these days, and when they did pop up, for some reason I pushed back against them all. It was around this time the world was being opened up to the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films, and with that being the first real modern superhero success, the marketing and hype around the character was absolutely everywhere. Lunchboxes, posters, TV shows, everyone knew and everyone loved Spider-Man. But not me. I don't know what exactly was going on in my head, but I remember distinctly saying that I hated Spider-Man, and I just wasn't that into superhero films. Even to this day, I still haven't gotten around to watching that original trilogy. Still, with me not really being a superhero fan, when The Incredibles released, it would have an awful uphill battle to win me over in some capacity. I think the only reason I even chose to watch it was because it was an animated movie. Maybe I was just biased against live action movies. Regardless, this movie blew my mind as a young kid. Even 16 years later, it still stands the tests of time. Despite the films of the modern day being oversaturated with superhero movies of all varieties, Somehow, the original Incredibles still stands out as its own unique take with some real strong moments. Let's start off with the actual characters first, shall we? And really, right off the bat, just the context of these characters highlights what stands out so much about this film compared to all of the others around it these days. This isn't yet another individual story. It's not about some underdog hero rising through the ranks with their powers. If anything, the actual powers are very much on the back burner. The premise alone says sets The Incredibles apart as it's the combination of the superhero and spy genre along with a setting and theme of family. The four main characters are a family, and though they have unique powers as every other team of superheroes would do, they're also all reflective of the everyday family household that can be found throughout all normal people as well. Mashing together this great duality of being fantastical powerhouses and relatable to just about everyone. And that context alone allows for far more investing and original tales to be told around the concept of superheroes. It's not all about powers and good versus evil. Take Violet for example. Sure, she has superpowers, multiple in fact, but they're not the core basis of her character. She's not interested in being yet another positive vigilante destined to make some good in the world. She's just a teenager having teenagery problems. She's a totally humanized character, as is the rest of the cast. Of course, the politics of the world also kind of pushes her superpowers into hiding, but that only acts as a great device to explore these tropes of characters in an entirely new way. As your relatable teenage girl, her biggest concern is of her romantic crush, Tony Ridinger. That was seriously his surname this whole time? Riding her? My god. But yes, with this being her core concern, her superpowers kind of act like an extra embodiment to that, as her personality is shy and retreated. So whenever she loses her cool, she hides herself by literally becoming invisible. You could probably also stretch the idea that she puts up barriers around herself in order to stay within her comfort zone to avoid being hurt. That's a pretty on-the-nose exploration of her teenagery traits, but of course, there's plenty more to her than just that. In the context of the whole family, she's the daughter and the older sister. 
sister. So naturally, she's of that bickering age with her less mature brother, Dash. Bickering like siblings do, she often spouts out more sarcasm over Dash's basic shouting. And at that rebellious stage, she's willing to voice out her opinions even against the rest of the family, criticising them. All of these round her out to be a pretty easy character to understand, and allows for a pretty simple development as she learns to grow more confident, develop her powers, and even defend her family and annoying little brother. It's not quite an origin story since she doesn't develop powers later like so many other superheroes, she's just a super without the hero attribute until it's necessary later. She's not some outstanding, fascinating character, but just the simple act of moulding all of these simple traits together forms a relatable character in a slightly less relatable world, and makes the whole thing unique, yet easy to follow. It's something the director Brad Bird calls the mundane and the fantastic, and I feel it works absolutely fantastically for all of the characters within this film. Same can be said for Dash, another semi-background character as just the other child. He also has his relatable young kid traits shown in his hyperactivity, boosted only by his speed, his affinity for the mischievous, and his desire to be the best of the best, even going so far as to also formulate his opinion on the whole politics of supers, disliking the idea of hiding his powers and not striving to push himself to his limits. He's energetic and joyful, and not just a shouting kid and over time learns to push for second place, putting away his ego and yet not squandering his superpowers entirely. He certainly made a mark on me. And me thinks if you're enjoying this content, then you should consider subscribing. You can see my unsubbed ratio count here, and maybe you can tip the scales. Okay, that's enough of the kids. Let's get on to the real big characters, Elastigirl. While considering the setting of the 1960s, this could easily be quite the restricted role for the mother of the family, and to a point, she is just a stay-at-home mum. But we can see she, much like every other female character in this movie, is strongly empowered. She's incredibly capable and clearly can hold her own in a multitude of ways, even if it's forced out of her in the worst case kind of scenario. Of course, she cares about her kids, but she's not some simple damsel in distress and is very much an equal to Mr. Incredible, able to argue against him when their opinions vary on the likes of supers and the change in society. And when following up on a potential cheating secret, she's not afraid to go out and confront the problem herself. But at the end of the film, she still loves her family, and her dialogue isn't just crammed up to be creative paranoia or conflict, as it's a naturally developing process as the movie's plot continues. And then we get to centre boy himself, Mr. Incredible. Now, obviously with him being the mainest character, he holds with him most of the story's plot and recurring themes one of which being his constant desire to go back to the glory days of presumably the 1940s. Back to a time where supers were accepted and looked up to, and desiring to be back on top again leads him to follow through on a secret mission that just so happens to be a trap from his greatest fan-turned-superhero syndrome, putting both his own life in danger as well as his family and kids when they soon follow him. What a midlife crisis scenario. As a character, he's your big brute with a good heart, but an immense desire. Though in realizing he's not a weak man for having a weakness, i.e. his family, he then learns that he is still on top of his game in his own little way. And he certainly doesn't want to sacrifice his family for the good old days. He is in fact content just the way things are. And finally, a good film's only as good as its villain, and Syndrome certainly stands out from a good crowd. Being the original clingy Incrediboy in the past, he has a knack for technology, granting him almost super-like powers without actually being a super. But his naivety causes more problems, and with an official rejection, he grows to become villainous in his intent. Though perhaps that was always his plan, striving to be good for his own sake rather than trying to save those in need. In fact, he is fully prepared to go so far as to put people in real danger just for the opportunity to fake saving them as their hero. As an adult, he's grown in scale, now owning his own island and a new AI machine that grows stronger through learning over time, creating a massive plan to kill all other supers, making it invincible enough to even take down the number one hero. Of course, it doesn't quite work out too well, as there was no plan for the teamwork of the whole family together, as well as a lack of loyalty from both his AI and his right-hand woman, and in general, he makes a lot of mistakes, misusing his own tech, not having backup plans, and in general, 
just not being as super as the supers are, from any angle. Plus, he simply wasn't reveled in the way he wanted to by the public, and his fate was lost to the most basic of rules. Interestingly, you could make a case for how Syndrome's type is usually the one to be the protagonist as the underdog striving above the bar, but his intentions were throughout all about himself. Selling tech and weapons for more money, and shooting down supers through murder and mediocrity. Of course, there's all the other characters to ramble about, and sure, I'd love to give you a full whole video dedicated to just Jack-Jack, but really, the point has gotten across more than enough. So we've already gotten how it merges a relatable cast into its super concept, but the film only goes further beyond that by not being a simple to-the-beat superhero story. In fact, its presentation in a lot of ways parodies the genre, and makes specific diversions away from it. All those superhero cliches happened 20 years ago, and now is the time to reflect on the absurdity of some of the theatrics. It's always awfully unrealistic when a villain monologues about their entire plan, and the film points that out in multiple places talking about the ridiculous repetitive nature of it all. And while ironically this film is actually designed like a cartoon visually, it chooses to divulge into elements of a super society that other cartoons often overlook for the pure fantasy spectacle of it all. The Incredibles actually explores how society would react in such a world, and how it would be changed over time. Highlighting the negative effects of superheroism, like destruction of property, civilian court cases, and the morally grey choices of hurting someone to avoid them dying. And then in the modern-ish day of the 60s, it then goes on to criticise a society more reflective of our reality and the growing prevalence of participation trophies and ceremonies for the default simple tasks. Something that goes directly against the reality of supers, suggesting absolutely nobody is special. So okay, the film has a unique spin on the genre, parodying the absurdities of cliches of the past, commenting on the real-life world with relatable yet strong characters in a way that makes it stand out from the crowd of superhero movies. What else does it have going for it? Well, although it's a pretty on the nose point, another massive part to making a good movie is having those good moments. Iconic scenes that stick into audiences' memories for years to come with a supporting choice in direction to wrap it all together. And really, when looking at The Incredibles, almost every scene is a masterpiece in its own way. The Glory Days sequence has this wonderful colour palette with equal parts humour, tone and drama. The scene with the boss is iconic without Bob even saying a single word. There's the breakdown of Dash's teacher as he chaotically tries to prove Dash's petty crimes. The family dinner scene that perfectly encapsulates every person's chemistry with the rest of the family. Any scene with Edna Mode in her chaotic chaotically neutral perspective. And that's just the calm dialogue scenes. Once the stakes build up, we've then got the fighting against the Omnidroid, meeting Syndrome, the plane scene, Helen sneaking into the island base, Dash running on water, Violet learning a new power while she tries to take a bullet for Dash, and of course, where's my super suit? Iconic. It's literally to the point that I really wouldn't change any of the elements in this film. Maybe that one line about fixing a table that never really broke, but that's such a minute, nitpicky point to tackle, you know? Moments like the 100 mile dash are things that have been permanently ingrained into so many of our memories as being that perfect fantasy scenario of being to act truly free as a young energetic kid. And boy does it feel empowering to see how much he can do. As a hyperactive kid myself, you can bet the moment I got out of this movie I was speeding along the street. It was just something I had to do, you know? But of course, all those fantastic moments wouldn't have really been nearly as punchy if it wasn't for one particular asset of films that really gets pushed under the rug with more modern movies, the soundtrack. Pixar has a pretty good track record of their sound department, but I think The Incredibles has to be one of their absolute best, perfectly mimicking that general superhero slash spy-like tone across the entire runtime, making it truly feel like your classic brassy 60s powerhouse of fantasy. But it goes beyond just the types of brassy instruments that are all strung into sounds like that main theme, the soundtrack adapts wonderfully to all sorts of other scenarios that the film thrusts into, and in all these scenes, the music heightens the moment even more. Sometimes it plays on that innocence and shy dynamic of Violet at school with simple flutes and violins covering the track, whilst sometimes it's a little suave and jivey as Mr. Incredible gets back into his workout mojo and improves his life for the better in preparation for his secret mission. Other times it's intense and dramatic, with drums and xylophones crashing in and increasing the speed as the climax of the film edges closer and closer. And with examples like the 100 mile dash again, there's so much that can be said for the constant sense of speed created through the use of those xylophones 
xylophones again, almost seeming to match the pacing of Dash's footsteps. And what only helps to add on to all of this sound design further, though is a pretty simple extra step, is the way that it is fully adaptive to the motions on the screen. These orchestral pieces are fantastic in a vacuum, but of course having them interact with the action on screen really gives it that little boost. And with the soundboard of The Incredibles being so loud at times, it really stands out. Whenever a certain character pops up on screen, the music changes tone with the chemistry they exude. When a character turns to react to something, the music follows in the continuation of what happens next. Sometimes it's a matter of the soundtrack muting down the volume for that more spy stealth scene, or the audible muffling sound of entering a tunnel. And sometimes it's that big bombastic jump at you kind of score. All of it just comes together to masterfully tick off all of the boxes of its job. The soundboard gives it both that incredibly unique style that stands out as its own unique design, whilst also exuding a clear homage to those 60s era Bond films and superhero movies and then focuses down on the small details to heighten every single moment of the film to feel like a well-orchestrated dance of audio and video. With all that in mind, it probably wouldn't come to much of a surprise to any of you that this soundtrack was legitimately the first movie soundtrack I ever decided to get my hands on. It's just iconic through and through. But of course there is one major element of all films that I somehow haven't gushed about quite yet, and it's your easy artsy perfectionistic angle on any kind of film, the cinematography. And honestly, I wasn't expecting to have all that much to say about The Incredibles. I remember it being good and looking fairly good, but as for the actual composition of it all, my memory said it was all fairly standard. It's not trying to be some artsy masterpiece, and yet, Looking over it again, I really missed out on recognising a lot of beautiful shots when I was younger. Obviously, the easiest example is once again the glory days with that warm sunset -y aesthetic that is just so saturated and colourful, but then there's all the other iconic shots you overlook. Look at the lava waterfall and exceedingly long table in the silhouette. It's your classic spy set design, and yet it just looks fantastic. Or Mr. Incredible's display of old articles and drawings. Or the high angle on his office job, crushing him into such a small cage in the frame. Kinda like his car as well, I guess. The shot of him lifting trains in his workout regiment. Or Edna Mode's massive wall carving towering over the tiny doorway. And that's just the great shot compositions. There's all sorts of other techniques used within this film that are pretty high brow for a 2004 animation. There's unique shots like a tracking over the shoulder shot of the Omnidroid as it charges. All sorts of examples of changing the focal length, which is a very conscious choice when it comes to animation and what looks to be a dolly zoom in places too. Then there's all sorts of symbolism, like Incrediboy's reflection being warped to be larger than his actual self, reflecting his enlarged ego and vision of being more important than he actually is. And just the simple trick of the camera at the point where Dash learns he can run on water. First shown in first person as the coast is reached and passed, only to reveal what's happening immediately afterwards, and then pulling back further to showcase the newfound freedom Dash has as even the ocean is now his playground. All of it together is just great stuff and only adds more to the package deal of this amazing example of storytelling. So let's now detour from the usual path and talk about the sequel. I won't linger on this for very long, but The Incredibles 2 is a thing. In fact, funnily enough, it was the very thing to kickstart my channel back up once I finished university two years ago, and it was the first movie content I officially made. Still, being a direct sequel to this film, it had some pretty big shoes to fill, and it did alright. I remember liking it at the time. And it was a good crowd pleaser judging by the numbers. But something about it just didn't quite hit that iconic perfectionist element of the first film. And while there's all sorts of explanations I'm sure, in general, it was just a whole lot less memorable, dropping many of the satirical elements of the original and opting for a more to the numbers kind of action movie. The stakes were lowered in regards to who was in danger, the characters had regressed or in some cases just completely been left out, and the plot came off awfully messy on all of its juggling parts and trying to follow up on Syndrome was just near impossible. But Evelyn still, it was a bit underwhelming, you know? I mean, all I was looking for was the 100 mile dash 2. 200 mile dash? Whatever the case, there was no kind of payoff whatsoever. 
I think even young me wouldn't have enjoyed that as much. But hey, the direction, creativity, and humor wasn't exactly a flaw in the movie. Anyway, with that tangent out of the way, what really makes The Incredibles stand out now, especially amongst the swarm of current superhero films, is its simple subversion of the cliched norms, and it daring to attempt to tackle the genre with a new spin, whilst not tarnishing many of the elements taken from its inspirations. It works out as simultaneously a fresh and original take on the concept, whilst also handling it as a love letter to what oh so many people are nostalgic of these days, with an added little bonus of comedic winks and nudges here and there about some of the ridiculous theatricals chucked around the genre. While it stands on its own path conceptually, everything about the filmmaking behind it only adds to heighten every aspect of the experience surrounding it, from the fantastic direction and cinematography, to the bombastic and in-sync orchestral soundtrack backing up every single beat of the film. The characters are fantastically relatable and yet inspiring thanks to Brad Bird's mundane and fantastic approach, and every cog in the machine seems to work perfectly in tangent to make this true masterpiece yet again from the magical series of Pixar. Is The Incredibles a perfect movie? Well, I may be a little biased ever since I was a young eight-year-old boy, but I believe I would have to say yes. To me, The Incredibles is indeed a perfect film. And especially in our modern superhero climate, the positive attributes of this film only seem to glow brighter. Kind of like those rose-tinted nostalgia goggles this film plays on its own glory days past. But that's just one guy's opinion. I'd love to hear what yours are down below. For now, my name's been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit. <sighs> the Incredibles is one of those films that I like know the entire sound of, because I used to watch it when I went to bed, you know? Very strange, but you know, good to know I had good taste, even as a young kid that didn't know what a good film was. Go me. <laughs>